So I'm going to talk a little bit about adventurous play and taking it outside. And uh, it was great this morning to start off the day by paddle boarding and, and getting out there and, and being out in the ocean. We'll talk about some of that later. But um, I want to start off with a little bit of a, 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 different, a different start, maybe. Um, I want you to think back. This is my, this is my childhood, essentially. Um, I want you to take special note of the excellent quality of these jeans. And uh, those particular jeans were my favorite jeans, as you may be tell, and I barely took them off. Um, and my grandma was my hero because if my jeans ripped and my mom threw them away, I would pull them out of the wastebasket, I'd put them in my grandma's mending basket, and all was well. And so I just want to read you a little bit of a, this is a poem, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really a poet, so forgive me, but I just want you to close your eyes for a second. As I read the poem, I want you to think about your own childhood. And I want you to think about the experiences that you may have had in, in your own childhood. You, you don't have to close your eyes if you don't want to. If you don't trust the person beside you, that's okay. <laughs> Make that work. So the poem is simply because I'm, I'm not a poet. I'm also not someone who spends a lot of time titling their poems. So this is just called Child. For a fleeting moment, the child is still. Face dirty and smiling. Jeans grass stained, torn, mended, torn again pockets full. Before the image really registered, the child is gone, a blur flying among the tall grass, fences and pastures, free to explore and enjoy movement everywhere in everything, bikes, balls, trees, fields, swings, space, pretending, feeling, building, creating, work is play, play is work. Sweating in the late afternoon sun, dirt clings but doesn't matter. All day he moves over the farm. Running, jumping, crawling, throwing, walking, creeping, leaping, rolling. The only constant is constant movement. Joy seeps through the dirt. Eyes are bright and expressive. Face mirrors mood, reveling in the smallest accomplishment. Sharing success excitedly with anyone who will listen. At the end of the day, he falls into a contented sleep, dreaming of joy yet to come. Are there any pieces in that that echo with your own childhood? opportunity to be free to run. Our kids now don't get a lot of that. They just, they just simply don't. And we're coming to realize that we really need to change that. And I want to share with you a short, a short video of why we should get outside. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was looking for a reason to live. Hi. Are you feeling tired? Irritable, stressed out, what well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature, a non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature is recommended for humans of all ages, and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature has proven to decrease work-induced catatonia. Caution. Nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor if nature is right for you. That, that last picture was uh, Andy Hare jumping off the pier at paddleboarding this morning. So there are a lot of benefits to nature. And as I'm sure you're aware, the kids that we teach really don't get out there much anymore. And they spend a lot, a lot of time on this. And it was really, really interesting. I was sharing with a couple people today. And I, I, won't have, I was going to try and pull it up on here. But I should have took a screenshot on my daughter's phone. So uh, my daughter's playing post-secondary volleyball at a school about two hours south of me, and I was driving past the other day, and so I picked her up to grab some supper. And we were comparing our, you know, you can have the little app on your phone that, that tracks your screen time, and it breaks it down to all the different apps and everything else. It was unreal in terms of, so basically over a seven-day period, she spent a full 12 hours on social media. Full 12, yeah, what? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I spent like 30 minutes. 
Um, so we had a boat, but it, it was a really good opportunity to have a conversation about, you know, what would you do with, and not that social media is bad and evil, it's not, please use hashtag APEC 2018. <laughs> but we need to monitor it and we need to know what we're doing with it. And part of it is, is when you're outside and, and you're experiencing nature, it gets harder and harder to pick that phone up. And so that, that's part of it. But we have all these different benefits. Right? We've got natural sources of vitamins, the creativity in nature, I'm not going to read all these, but problem solving, physical development, the multi-sensory piece is really important. When you've got a structured, designed obstacle course, whereas when you're getting out into nature and you're bending under and over trees, it's really super important to move in that direction. And so we want to take a look at why we don't get outside, why we don't do enough. And so I'm going to basically go through some, um, some research on um, some pieces on getting outside, some pieces on active play, and then I'll move into kind of adventurous play and risk taking. And then we'll, uh, we'll settle out from there. And we may, if we have time, we may improvise a little dance. I'll get Tracy to help me. And we'll uh, just random, we'll improvise something. It might happen, it might not. I just thought I'd prep you 20 minutes in advance, Tracy, so we're good to go. So this, this uh, piece here from the participation report card on physical activity for children and youth came out in 2015. And I love the title because the biggest risk is keeping kids indoors. So I want to share a few pieces of research from here. This is a compendium of research, which is really helpful because it means I don't have to do all the work and neither do you. Um, so this may seem, and a lot of these you're kind of going, like when I was a kid, the, the phrase was duh, as in hello, this makes sense. But it does. So if we're playing outside, there are two times you're more likely to be, a, uh, sorry, two times more activity, and this is in preschool kids. And we know that. They're up there moving around, there's more space to move. Okay, we know that happens. 35% more steps when you take your phys ed class outside. Okay, maybe, maybe that 35% is just from the gym to wherever you're going, but that's okay, right? It's a few more steps. We're good at that. This one I found really intriguing. So the guidelines, uh, worldwide are, are 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day, three times more likely to meet those guidelines if you play outside after school. So we need to try and facilitate that. If you're outdoor, you move more, you sit less, you play longer. And we never want to tell kids that it's, you know, at recess, if they need to go outside and they need to sit under a tree for a while, that's what they need to do, right? But they're out there. So it's not always about the movement, it's about being outside, being in places. We need to also look at the, the idea of danger and or risk and where are we going. So just to give a few stats, you know, the odds of being abducted by a stranger are pretty darn low. Okay? Now, what the stat that I'm not putting up here is the odds of being abducted by a family member. Okay, so shh, don't, don't want to talk about that. There are injuries associated with outdoor play, but most of them are minor. And yes, you're going to get some injuries. And I, my, my wife grew up in a very, very restrictive home, like don't do anything, like literally, oh, it's concrete, don't run on the concrete. Like, why would you not run on the concrete? But my trump card was when my daughter broke her arm because she broke her arm by falling off a chair. So I'm like, well, we could just go sit and then break our arms. So let's go, we can make that happen. So it was good. Now, that being said, she was sitting on a chair and then she was pretending she was a cat and she jumped to another chair and fell off and broke her. But I'd leave that detail out. It's okay. <laughs> leave that out. But really, they're, they're minor injuries, okay? And yes, sometimes we get major injuries, but compared to other, other spots, like this, you're more likely to die as a passenger than being hit by a vehicle, riding your bike, skateboarding, walking to school, etc. So that's kind of a sobering thought in terms of, of the amount of driving we do. Okay, and we know this. Hyperparenting limits physical activity, and it also... That, that whole building of resilience, self-efficacy, all those good things, self-esteem, we're inhibiting that because we're not teaching our, our children how to self-manage. And then kids are less active when they're closely supervised. And again, I, I, I'll keep using my wife for an example because she's a recovering elementary teacher who's now in junior high, so she needs to recover from that for a while. And she teaches math, which is really weird and I don't understand it, but we'll get that. But at her last school, it was a, most of the, the, uh, the parents in that school are pretty well off. And I discovered, because I came to her school and I was doing some stuff for the kids, those kids do zero activity without an adult present. They are never engaged in activity without an adult. They don't know how to solve problems. On the playground, if something happens, 
They go right to the recess leader. They don't try and solve anything. And I think it's because they don't know how. They just don't, they don't really have a choice. So when we look at because, we want that. They're, they're more curious. Who here has ever got their kid a, a gift in a bigger box and all they do is play with the box? S same kind of thing, right? <laughs> Jason's got his hand up extra high. It's good to go. It's, it's a natural curiosity builder, those natural spaces. We also know that it leads to resiliency, self-regulation, stress management and, uh, management, and many other things. When we have minimally structured and free and accessible play, and this is something we struggle with sometimes in phys ed because we want to have everything structured. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying structure is bad. We don't want to eliminate everything. But what are the opportunities to reduce some of that structure and put more of the ownership on the kids? Okay, we get that socialization, the idea of isolation goes away, we have interpersonal skills, and again, it's that healthy development piece. So this is the position statement coming up here from this whole report. Okay, so we can look at it this way, and, I really, and I've highlighted the key points because I think it's important that we have to acknowledge that outdoor play, yeah, there's risks. There's also risks with indoor play. Hey, I had, a, I had a kid in my phys ed class years ago who, who ran along the bleachers and attempted to dunk by jumping off the bleachers um, and had never dunked before and so kind of caught his finger and landed on his teeth. So not so great, right? So these things happen. We need to put things in place to, to help that. But again, we want to increase children's opportunities for that self-directed play outdoors in all settings. We are part of the picture, okay? Now, in my humble mind, we're the most important part of the picture, maybe outside of parents and sometimes above parents, it, just in my, in my opinion. But we have that role. So therefore, there's a few recommendations out of this report, okay? So number one for parents, how many, how many people are parents in here? How many people know where their kids are right now? I have no idea, but, okay? Encourage your children, and it may have to be structured a little bit, all kinds of weather conditions, okay? Our kids aren't made of sugar, they don't melt. Right, my favorite memories as a kid, so I grew up on a farm, as I said, we'd have to take the school bus into school. So in the winter time, you know, it's cold, we had a little straw bale shelter, we'd wait down there, and pretty soon it's like, huh, bus is kinda late. Bus is not coming, sweet, it's too cold. Engine block froze, good deal. We ran back to the house, grab a cup of hot chocolate, outside the whole day to play. Dressed appropriately, right? So you dress for the weather. We need risk assessment, and I'll talk about this a little more later, but risk assessment for kids and their own ability to manage themselves in spaces is important. As educators, we can embrace the outdoors, and there's a huge movement starting to look at using outdoors, not just for physical education or health education, but also moving into all sorts of curricular areas. Okay, getting kids outside is important. Um, risky play should not be eliminated, and I know there are barriers in place. We have different rules and guidelines we need to follow, and we can work with those. Um, I joked, I have a sabbatical coming up this year, I joked with my wife, I'm going to go back and get a law degree, and I'm going to sue the insurance companies. Because I, I firmly believe they're responsible for a lot of the, the crap that we're dealing with these days. Um, I've got a colleague that teaches in Northern Alberta. He teaches outdoor education, they do all sorts of good activities, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing, skeet shooting, all sorts of cool stuff. Their school board switched insurance companies. Two thirds of the things that he does, he can no longer do. So we need to find ways to fight against that a bit. We really need to do that. So finally, society. We need to recognize that kids are competent and capable. And I'm sure you've heard of the different stories of you know, a 10 year old kid walking to the playground by themselves and some parent phones. And next thing you know, social services is involved. Okay? We need to really push against that. So part of it is most of you in here, I would say all of you in here, I can go out on them, all of you in here, does anyone not fall into one of these categories? Is anyone not a member of society? Just checking, maybe you're a hermit, maybe you checked out. So we can do this stuff. And that curiosity is super important. And I wanna share this, this, this is from Peter Gray, who's a, an evolutionary psychologist. And he talks about the human educative instinct. How are we hardwired to learn? And so this comes from a study, um, which you can see here from, from Sugata Mitra. It happened in Mumbai, India. 
And what they did there is they put, they put a computer terminal into the side of the wall. Right? How many people have heard of this study before? I've seen a few nods, quite a few. Okay, so I'll be quick. But computer terminal on the side of the wall, 24-hour video and audio recording. Within three days, about three to 400 kids in the neighborhood became computer literate, all on their own. No instructions. Weird, huh? Because they figured it out. And what Peter Gray is positing is it's through three things. So the first thing is that curiosity. And it's that drive to understand and explore. And curiosity, as we know, is stimulated by being outside. It's stimulated by taking a risk and trying things. So they go up to the computer, well, what's this? I'm curious. You start pushing some buttons. Suddenly it turns on. Oh, cool. So we're exploring things. We're trying to figure out how do they work? What goes on? The next piece is that idea of playfulness. And we, we practice, and you can call it practice, but it's play. You play with things. You know, I'm getting, gonna get an idea and I play with things. And as physical educators, that's what we do best, right? We play with stuff all the time. Uh, as Andy says, we, we make a mess. We, it's really messy trying to figure stuff out and we fail and we succeed and we fail and we fail and we fail and then maybe succeed again. So that's that practice and create piece. And then the last piece is the sociability. And that's what this conference is about, really. It's sharing our ideas, sharing back and forth. And it's that drive to share. We don't want, we're not hardwired to keep things to ourselves. We're hardwired to share successes and not just on Twitter. And we should also be hardwired to share our failures because they're maybe even more important than the successes because we can learn more from them. So when we look at this piece, we know that we have to work with this for a kid. So in your, in your phys ed lessons, how are you driving curiosity? How do you do that? When I went paddle, where's, where's is, is uh, Mike in here today that went paddleboard? Oh, there he is, yeah. I love the way, I was talking with Mike as I was trying to not fall off my paddleboard about how he teaches paddleboarding. And it's really about curiosity. How does this board interact with the water in my body? Figure it out, get started. Instead of going, okay, step A is to get here, step B is to go here, step C is to go there. They're learning together. Couple people on the board, can you have two people switch boards? They're playing with that stuff. So they go right from curiosity into playfulness. And it's not like it's a step, it goes back and forth, back and forth. So these are important, but unless we never take any risks, we're really never gonna, we're really never gonna get ahead. So this is one definition of taking a risk, okay? And this is what most risk assessment uses. So the potential of loss or an undesirable outcome resulting from a given action, activity, and inaction, okay? And I know this is true because it's from Wikipedia and we all know that's true. <laughs> so if we look at it this way, but part of, so we're very anti-risk right now. But if you look back and forth through history, we have a lot of people who are key risk takers. Okay, this is, this is a very, very common phrase, right? Ben Franklin. What about Eleanor Roosevelt? You know, do one thing every day that scares you. And Lululemon stole that and put it on their bags and they didn't credit Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> just, just making that point, okay? Albert Einstein, okay? There's no risk of accident for someone who's dead. So to fear death is unjustified. Why bother? Okay, kind of a cool way of looking at things. I get inside that guy's head. This one I love. And if, if you're not familiar with Helen Keller, you know, pioneered uh, Braille. Just, if, if you ever read her biography or a biography written about her, it's absolutely mind-blowing, stunning. But I love this piece. Security is a superstition. It doesn't exist in nature. Really, we don't experience security. It's a false peace. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. And this coming from someone who is blind and deaf and had to experience the world that way. What an amazing adventure. And for her to categorize that as an adventure is mind-numbing. It's phenomenal. So when we get into risky or adventurous play, we start, and there's, there's some emergent research coming out, largely um, Sandsetter's doing some things, Maria uh, Brissoni out of, out of BC is doing a lot of neat stuff. There's lots of people doing work on this. I've just pulled a few, a few key pieces for just to, to touch on this as we go along. But basically, the definition is this, okay? Thrilling, exciting forms of play that involve a risk of physical injury, and the risk can be real or perceived. And we can play around with that a little bit. But what we start to see, this, I'd rather see a sign like this play at your own risk, 
Rather than no rollerblading, no roller skating, no ball playing, no skateboarding, no bicycle riding, no, 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 no. We've got schools that have banned tag. We've got schools that have banned hard balls, which include a soccer ball on the playground because some parent got hit in the head. Okay? I think not hard enough, but <laughs> just, just one man talking. I don't know. So there are, there are a few categories that we can put things in. And as I, I'm just going to go through these really briefly, and then we're going to do a little activity that I'm going to ask Tracy to help me with. We're going to make it up as we go along, because it'll be fun, right, Trace? OK, good deal. So there's, there's a few categories. The first one is great heights. Getting up there, the danger of injury from falling. And great heights is relative. When you're 13 months, this is a great height. And the whole idea of affordances is a really cool concept. So, so for us, this might be a step. For a two-year-old, it's a seat, right? And we look at how does that work? But that, that thrill of being up high, right? It's, it's important. How many people here have ever climbed a tree? Right, without permission. Nice, got busted for it and yelled at. Yeah, it happens. We, it shouldn't happen, but we do, right? You get up in those trees, it's cool. It's exciting, and it's partly thrilling because there is a thrill of danger, right? That's where rock climbing is fun. It's good. Next one is high speed, and I love this picture. <laughs> Look at the grin on that kid's face. Unreal. Right? I love doing tobogganing and sledding with my, with my kids and my students. And the idea of that you can lead to collision with something or someone or maybe just a big old wipeout, that thrill of high speed is amazing and you get on that bike or you get on that sled and you get moving fast and it gets your blood pumping, right? And we'll talk about perception of risk as we go along. The next one is dangerous tools. Ooh, might lead to an injury. We shouldn't let kids have a knife. When I was a kid, I brought a knife to school every day. Yeah, I grew up in the hood. It was pretty, <laughs> pretty tough. But literally, I, I had a knife growing up on a farm, always had a knife for stuff. You're cutting twine, you're doing things, and I did. I brought a knife to school every day. We used, did anyone play stretch? Anyone play stretch? Or chicken? You stand across from somebody like this, and you throw the knife between your feet, and then you have to move your foot, and then you throw the knife again, and you move your foot. Yeah. We used to play that up in a tree. <laughs> People think I'm kidding, but I'm not. <laughs> Yeah, um, my mother's not well. She hasn't been for a while. It's a, but that idea that we can, we can play with things that may lead to injuries and wounds, it doesn't mean we don't give proper instruction or teach how to do that. And I was taught, my grandpa taught me how to use a knife and how when you're carving to make sure it's pointing away from you and what to do. But we don't necessarily have those skills all the time. The other one's dangerous elements, and it's pretty self-explanatory, right? Could be fire, could be water. Um, it's, it's a little bit risky. Right? My, my poor sister has a scar on her shoulder from a flying burning marshmallow from a bonfire. This kid was waving it to get it off of his stick and it flew and stuck on her shoulder. Okay? Beautiful memory. It's just beautiful. <laughs> just playing with dangerous elements. It's important. The next one is rough and tumble play. Right? Yes, children can get hurt in rough and tumble play, but they also learn boundaries and limits. They learn how that works. Um, a preschool researcher that I, I went to one of her sessions a few years ago, and speaking of dangerous elements, I may fall off the back of the stage, so if I suddenly disappear, you'll know why. I'm just engaging in risky, uh, adventurous play. Um, but her theory was if you have, so if you have two five-year-olds that are playing together, and they're playing together and it gets a little physical and they're wrestling, and one of them gets mad and punches the other kid in the nose, and that kid get, gets mad and punches the other kid in the stomach, well, they've learned consequences. They've learned what goes on. But have you ever been hit by a five-year-old? Like, it doesn't hurt. They can't, they can't wind up and get a lot behind, so they can't really hurt each other. And her logic was, wouldn't you rather have five-year-olds rough and tumbling learning that at five than at 19 or 20 when they're drunk after being in a bar? And that's their first time, so like, and not that that's the example we want to get to. That's not what we're holding up there. You gotta learn this now before you're drunk. See, that's not, that's not my message, so don't, don't, don't hashtag that or tweet that out. Okay. In fact, I retract that entire statement, entire statement. But it's that idea of learning. And again, I'll, I'll keep using examples from my childhood. We literally had a game that was called playing rough. 
And that involved my two older brothers and I, and then eventually my younger sister. And it was my mom's chance to just chill out. And we'd go with my dad in the living room, and he would stand there, and we would try and get him down to the ground. And we'd come at him, and he'd grab our heads and go, Whoosh. And you grab on and we'd steal his slipper and we just we'd play rough and sometimes it ended in tears somebody got a little bit hurt i put my head through the wall once okay which is for those of you that know me well it's not surprising um, that i did that in the past lots of impact but we need to have that rough and tumble play but often we we shut it down right away and yes there needs to be limits and boundaries but if we have that starting earlier we can get that done the next one is the idea of disappearing and getting lost okay this doesn't mean we just you know beginning year for z class See ya, kids. <laughs> Hope you make it back. <laughs> Especially you. You don't come back. It's okay. <laughs> you, you can just go. But, and if you've got little, little kids, like disappear is this, right? You can't see me, I can't see you. It just means being able to, in the playground, being able to, you could be surrounded by people, but you're in the center of a, a bush and you can't see anybody else. It's a great feeling. Right? It's a great feeling of just, I can disappear, and the idea that the adults can't see me. Okay? That's important. And there are precautions we need to put in place, of course, but we need to do that. Okay, so here's my thought. We've got these six pieces. We have three sections. So I want to divide each section in half, and I want you to come up with a dance move that illustrates your particular category, okay? And it's just gonna be a simple, something you can do for about four counts. So as an example, maybe dangerous tools, you know, you could be doing, you could go. <laughs> I'm not a dancer, can you tell? <laughs> we make it work. So I want you to come up, and it's gonna be a little bit hard with this section, but so this section we're gonna split, just kind of right up the middle, and just turn around and talk, and let's figure out, so this is gonna be great heights. This is gonna be high speed. Then kind of this section here is going to be dangerous tools, dangerous elements, rough and tumble play, and then the rest of you can get lost. Okay? <laughs> so you've got a minute and a half. Okay, so that's good. Yeah, I got a, some left. This will fill in pretty good, I think. So okay. should be good. Oh no, it's okay. Yeah, if it's okay for you. Okay, talk to each other. Okay, let's, uh, let's see what we got here. Now pay attention because we're going to do all of these eventually. So let's get a demo from the great, oh look, it was up, great heights. Let's see what you got. Climbing, climbing, and still climbing. Okay, I like it, that's good, still climbing. Okay, and how about our uh, high speed people? What do you got for us, high speed? Oh, oh, like it. <laughs> Hey, there we go, nice. 
and synchronicity there too. Okay, what about the dangerous tools? I was scared. I was scared. That was good. Uh, dangerous elements. <laughs> oh. My sister would be proud. Oh. Oh. Awesome. I like how you went right to the hard surfaces and just get it done right away. Okay, and our final group to disappear and get lost. One, four, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice. <laughs> Woo! Okay, let's all stand up. Did you help your group? You can come up here and dance if you want with me, Tracy. So we're going to attempt to do that. I'm going to put some music on. We're gonna start over there and do your moves and we're just gonna flow through. So like four count, we'll see how this goes. You're all physically, oh no, you gotta start standing because you do the same as that group. So we're gonna start with great heights and just come in when you're ready. There we go, Ed. Nice, let's go to high speed. Sitting down. Dangerous tools. With the beat, people, with the beat. There we go. Nice. Okay, moving to yeah, dangerous elements. Rough and tumble play. Punch, punch, punch. Get lost. Give yourselves a huge round of applause. Huh. What do you know, that worked. <laughs> bit of an experiment, so that was fun. So a little bit more on risk before we go on. So this is from a, a big meta-analysis looking at 21 articles, 18 studies, and overall positive effects okay of risky outdoor play and some people are moving to say adventurous outdoor play because it it scares people less than saying risky play okay um it's kind of like no i won't say it i'll leave it i'll move it on <clears throat> i was going to say something inappropriate i'm moving on um when you play at height so when we're up there climbing it's not related both to fracture severity and frequency so that's important to know and we can share these things when children have the opportunity to play in a rough and tumble way, it does not increase their aggression. Okay? And again, when you support risky or adventurous play, it's more playtime, more social interactions, more creativity, and more resilience. And the biggest thing that's facing our children today is a lot of mental health issues. And we know that mental health doesn't stand alone, right? It's connected all the way through. So we gotta, we gotta go with that. Um, Anyone familiar with Alex Honnold? Okay, the new movie out, Free Solo. Have, has anyone seen it yet? No? Okay. Um, he just free soloed a, a building in New Jersey maybe a couple months ago. Just, and for those of you who don't know what free solo means, it just means you climb it. There's no ropes, there's no, no safety stuff, just some chalk and some, some good shoes. Okay? Now, I'm not advocating for you to send your kids to go climb up a, bu a building, but I do like the way he, he talks about it, and he says, I differentiate between risk and consequence. Sure, falling from this building is high con consequence, but for me, it's low risk. When you're self-selecting and when children learn how to assess risk, now I would, I would do a free solo on about a 12 to 15 foot boulder. I'd do that, but I wouldn't do it on here because my own assessment of the risk and my skills doesn't cut it. And I also like his, his other quote was, anybody could conceivably die on any given, any given day. Soloing just makes it feel much more immediate and present. <laughs> <laughs> but this idea of choosing your risk,
Um, I used to do a lot more mountain biking than I do now and downhill stuff. I used to go off big jumps and drops. I don't do that anymore because I still go off stuff that other people might think, oh, wow, that's a big risk, but it's not because I have the skills to do it. And unfortunately, the way we define risk management doesn't really help us. This is the way that when a, a risk assessor looks at things, they look at R being risk. So the risk is equal to the magnitude of the potential loss multiplied by the probability of the loss will occur. Does anyone see any problems with this piece? Go ahead, shout it out. Any problems? It's an uneven scale. We're only looking at the negatives. Only looking at the negatives. There's no positive piece in here. So if I want to go, this is Horseshoe Lake in Jasper, that's my son just dropping into the water, okay? Actually, it might be me, that's my position. <laughs> okay, um, so that's, you know, maybe 30, 40 feet, something like that. This, this particular, it's an old quarry, you can go up to 95 feet, okay? I, I jumped the 95 foot one when I was younger, I would not do it now. I was wearing uh, like strap-on Velcro sandals, when I hit the water, they just blew off. And I sunk for a long, long ways. <laughs> But, so should I let my son do this? He's 14, he, you know, or this, at this point, sorry, he was, he was maybe 10 or 12. If I just use the risk assessment model, no way, because all sorts of things can happen. He could drown, he could land badly and hurt himself, right? He could, he could biff it, go on and maybe hit rocks on the way down and get a serious injury. So if we only looked at life in terms of what might happen, we're screwed. We're not doing anything. I shouldn't even step off this stage. I'll get Ben to help me, help me down, okay? But this is limited. So I'd like to propose something a little bit different where risk is equal to, so what is the maximum opportunity for gain with the potential and what is the loss times your earned competence? So when I go back to Isaiah trying to jump off that cliff, what does he have to gain from it? He already knows how to swim. He used to do gymnastics and trampolining and things, so he knows how to move his body in the air. Those are skills that contribute to the idea of him being successful. And then, the confidence, the, the risk of him jumping off this 20 or maybe a 40 foot cliff is actually pretty low compared to what he can get out of it. And quite honestly, as his father, if he breaks his arm going down or he, he cracks his tailbone as I did off the 60 foot cliff, that's worth it. It's worth it. And maybe we don't say that enough, and I, and I could maybe get criticized for that, but I do think it's worth it. And this is, it's kind of confirmed, um, so Michael Unger is another psychologist, and he looks at, like, we know that when we, children push themselves slightly beyond their comfort zone, and they're given opportunities to fail. And if you, I, I used this example when I did my keynote last time, but the idea of being in a skate park, if you spend time in a skate park, those kids are wiping out, there's blood, there's tears, but there's a lot of success and there's a lot of earned competence that's going on. So we need to give children these opportunities to encounter dangerous situations. And that's the broad, like I'm not talking opportunity to walk down dark alleys at one in the morning, okay? but these other opportunities. Um, better to take risks when the danger is small and we are supervised than when we are older and unsupervised. So there's a piece there. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this little showing of a video, but the idea of forest schools are really taking over, and not that we all need to go to a forest school, but that idea of being outside and taking the risks. So instead of showing this video, I want to share a little bit of a story about a, a, a guy by the name of Magnus. So this is from a book by, by Carl Honoré called Under Pressure, Rescuing Our Children from the Culture of Hyper-Parenting. So uh, actually in Scandinavian countries, sometimes they call these curling parents. Any idea why? They try and sweep all the obstacles out of the way of their kids. Okay, helicopter parents, but we're, we're doing our kids a disservice. So Carl went to go visit this forest school and he saw this kid, Magnus, who had a, a pretty decent burn on his hand. And so he asked about it and the kid, so they were out and it was cold and so they built a fire. And they were using those carbide fire starters, which is really super hot, and he got a nasty burn. So he was immediately thinking there's gonna be lawsuits, kids pull them out. No, the parents are like, yeah, that's just part of it. He's learning. And so his mom said, you know, of course we were a little concerned at first when he got burned, but the truth is there are risks in the world and children benefit from being exposed to them within reason. 
Later on, Carl went back to that school and he went out there again and Magnus was there, little Magnus was there, and he was making a fire and he turned over, and he turned over to, to Carl and he said, I'm, Carl said, are you okay making this fire? He's like, yeah, I'm okay. He says, are you afraid? He's like, no, I'm not afraid. And then he kind of whispered to himself, I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> so kids learn from those things. They definitely do. And you do have to be careful with fire. But that idea of, of being, of taking care rather than being careful, it's a subtle switch. But you're taking care to assess risks and go forward. You don't have to be afraid of it. So the last piece, I just, there's a, I, I've started with a poem and I'll finish with a poem. And, I'm, and then I'm like two minutes ahead of my time, so I'm good. So this is a poem by Judy Brown and just entitled Fire, and I think, it, I think it's applicable to our conference today. And so if you just listen to the words and, and apply it to your learning, your interactions, um, what you're gonna bring back to your schools. What makes a fire burn is space between the logs, a breathing space. Too much of a good thing, too many logs packed in too tight can douse the flames almost as surely as a pail of water would. Hang on, I'm just getting an automatic update. I'll just remind me later. So building fires requires attention to the spaces in between, as much as to the wood. When we are able to build open spaces in the same way we have learned to pile on the logs, then we can come to see how it is fuel and the absence of the fuel together that make fire possible. We only need to lay a log lightly from time to tire, time. A fire grows simply because the space is there with openings in which the flame that knows just how it wants to burn can find its ways. So I hope you can take this and find some opportunities for your children and your students, your own children, but your students to find those spaces in between and grow in terms of risk and adventurous play. Thanks for having me here.